Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome to the Property Couch podcast. Hello, Ben. How are you going? G'day, mate. How are you? I'm very good. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time, Ben, to have this conversation with you. Why is that, Bryce? What, to- how, what conversation how's the are we calling, having? How's the Collingwood swagger going? Well, what do you mean? Did, did, did you get a bath? Over there in Perth? We over did. In, over across the Nullarbor? Yes. We acknowledge that we were outplayed on the day significantly. We haven't acknowledged nothing. This is the first time that we've we've talked since since that you got absolutely smacked. <laughs> smacked? Look, yes, we did by the Premiership favourites, the team that by really Western is Australia, there to mate, lose. You got smacked by Western Australia. Oh, now you take the ownership. <laughs> this, had, this, had, 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 had it, it felt, it felt like... their score? It, it felt yeah, like the day. We'll we'll come to that. But it felt like <laughs> the day I was sitting at your house two grand finals ago when I went onto national telly and predicted that West Coast would win after the siren, and they were only a minute thirty away from doing that. <laughs> and to, to be, it was just brilliant. Hey, don't forget hey, of I, which I predicted also that West Coast would win. Don't don't forget I I was a West Coast supporter Ben from eighty seven to. 94, and nice. also it was at the grand final in 2006. I don't like to admit it too clutching. much to West Coast mates, but I still... Oh, have... yeah, yeah, clutching at straws there. So you changed your football team, so really... No, no very much Fremantle, but just saying it was it was enjoyable. So let's talk about Frio. How was their performance? We will talk about Frio, because Fremantle versus Collingwood are playing this week. So yes, no, the people. grudge match. Very so, true. So yeah, I've set it... The best set, team win. I've set it up for a very big backhander next week, <laughs> <laughs> based on me front-footing it this week. So that's why I've got in nice and early. Very good, very good. Hey, I want to do a call out, Ben, to all non-Melbourne and non-Port Adelaide supporters okay. uh, listening to our podcast. Because um, tonight, on Escape from the City, yes, um, I'll be the host, Ben. Oh, very be nice. Host. ABC, so, what time? Um, geez, I knew you were going to ask that. I think it's I think it's eight <laughs> o'clock. You don't even know what time your show's I on. I think it's eight o'clock, Ben. So if you get that eight o'clock and it's on at eight thirty, you'll be there early. <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely be tuning you in. You won't be watching it, don't I like will it. be tuning in. You, you watch will. me. And for those people who are not listening to this podcast on a Thursday, Ben, as it comes out, you can catch up on ABC iView. Okay. Um, and and we, are you going to give away the destination or is that? First, home, is that, first home owners. Um, first home, yeah. We, at what state are we in? In Victoria. Okay. Um, All right. Cool. So, and it's, is that enough? Just just down sort of um, just down the highway, just just peninsula way. Okay. No, 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 just in oh. the fringe. So, mm, all right. Okay. So, Exciting. Yeah. So if anyone anyone pre COVID uh, like support that, that'd be great. Hey, um, and last thing, Ben, um, I am going to go into the studio this afternoon and finish the audio book. Uh, what, second what, you, what audio book is that one? <laughs> the, the, the armchair guide to property. Oh, the armchair guide to property. Oh, right. Okay, great. You remember? You remember? I've done this once before. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and hey, do you know how a Stiggy never says anything on? She never write a reply or anything. Correct. So what I can do is I can blame her, and she won't defend herself. Ben. So is that so possible? What, so you recorded it, but the quality was no good. Well, I recorded it. Uh, the settings. So in her defence, she did an amazing job, right, and continues to do so. But the first time I recorded it was in peak. Lockdown um, sent one at one point oh right, yeah. And so she's come into the office the day before, so she's done all the right things, set up all the settings on the audio, gave me all these instructions that I followed to a T. Um, but unfortunately, uh, her voice settings were what they were were for Ben, not not my voice settings. Right. And therefore, when she's listened to it back, um, ready to produce it, it didn't sound very good, Ben. So we didn't want to put out an inferior product, so we're doing it again. Okay. And um, it will be finished. Well, so. I'm glad it's you and not me because we all know that my um, written and spoken word is terrible. Um, and but obviously, you want to write a reply there? Just yeah, letting in the stink. Yep, because she is on the call. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we've got a nice <laughs> we've visual got image that. there, but we can't share that on uh, radio or well, on, podcast. On podcast. So there you go. Let's just say she responded, and it wasn't um, yeah. it wasn't uh, for, for audio. Um, all right, so Ben, my mindset minute today. Before we oh, get can into I, can, just before you do, I've just got a little quick little shout out for um, for a webinar that's coming up, Bryce. 
So we have a webinar coming up with Veronica Anyone Morgan, your co-host from she? Location, Location, Location her? Australia. You know Veronica, we've had her on the couch a yes, couple of times and she's going to be doing a webinar Television on, wide. on the four, Tuesday night, the 4th of August. Um, so I, I'm excited about it. So she's going to give you the inside guide to buying property, right? So she's going to talk about true. auctions. So it's going that she's one of Australia's best buyers agents um, and property experts. So we are thrilled. Um, and again, Incredibly it's exclusive. street smart is how I would describe uh, the very young Veronica Morgan. She yep. is very, um, she, she's a great buyer's agent, you meant that, but she's yes. just got this knack of being really street smart. So yes, yeah, so she's great. So we, we can't wait to have her on. So to, to, to join that and to get all of that education and also the replay, you've mm. got to be a member of Picker. Mm. So how do you do that? It's $5. Uh, to join the association at www.picker.asn.au. So sorry about that. I know it wasn't in the uh, the run through sheet, but I just couldn't forget to mention it. That um, jump on. We'll put it in the show notes. Uh, a link to the membership page, and you get on there, and then um, you'll get access to that webinar. Very good. Well, I better I better tune in, Ben, just to support uh, Ronnie. Um, but of course, um, that'll be very very good. So. Well done for sticking that in. You you good? Anything? Any other last minutes? Or? No, no, that's all good for now. Until what's making property news. <laughs> you ready? You ready for that? <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, my mindset minute theme today, Ben, is: Have you read um, "How to Win Friends and Influence People" by uh, uh, Dale Carnegie? I, I think I've skipped through the uh, summary edition of it. I couldn't say I've read it from cover to cover. Benjamin, pick it up and read it. it like if I could, if I had to, if I had to wipe out. Everything I know, except for one book, that'd be that'd be the one because That's I reckon I could get everything back because I do know that book. Mm. And there you go, I just talked right. it up. Written in 1937, Ben. Yeah. Dale Carnegie is the ultimate in storyteller. Like just. All right. So I'm gonna have to check put it, it on. My, I've got now, a few books there in so, COVID ISO that I'm getting through. Are you finding that you're doing more audio books than reading at the moment or are you still old school and you're happy to flick through the old... Uh, uh, I'll tell you what I do do. I, I, I now buy the audio book first. Yeah. And if I really like the content, I actually buy the book. Yeah, because then, um, you can read then I've got the documented yeah. stuff that I want and I can highlight it I, and then I basically put it into the war chest. I like how you're old because I've got another book on um, Kindle that I love, but I'd love to be able to physically hold mm. it because there's a couple of chapters that I'd really like to... Anyway. Now you can record some of those and put them into a you know Evernote or one you know a OneNote site type format. But I for, there's something about the you and know I just wanted I just want it on the library and I just want to go to it and I've got you know I turn the corner pages down and I've got the highlights and I yeah right. that's what I do. All right, very good. Well, the reason I'm talking about how to win friends and influence people, Ben, is I have flagged that uh, my wife is is in a book club, um, and they've been doing the magic of thinking big. They've done Atomic Habits with. James Clear, I can't yep. remember the other one. Now they're on to how to win. For it. So it's sitting on the desk, right? So I've picked it up. And I, like, I haven't read the book for 20 years, right? Mm. But I just remember it was so impactful. So I, I remember, um, uh, I think I've told this story. I, 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 got a, I got an accounting degree. And then as soon as I finished accounting degree, I went and worked in retail in, in Fremantle to my parents' horror, thinking, <laughs> what the dickens did you just go through four years of, of uni yeah. to go and work in retail in Fremantle? But the answer was because I, I, in my sphere of influence, I wasn't around any business people, right? So one of my mates, Dad, mm -hmm. owned a retail store in Fremantle. And so I thought, um, this is how ignorant I was at the time or naive, but I thought if I go and work there, I'll be able to rub shoulders and ask lots of questions because ultimately I want to learn how to be in business. Yeah. So they, they did this course and I didn't have enough money. So they did this course, which was the Dale Carnegie course, and it came with these three books, How to Win Friends, Influence People, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, and how to develop self-confidence through public speaking. And so I couldn't do the course, which was a couple of thousand in it for money, but I could read the textbook. So I said to him, can you lend it to me? And I just devoured it because they're written in such a style, so easy to read. Yeah. So long, long run No, up big intro. My, it's, a my big, yeah, it's a big build up. I hope but this what is going to land. Is, <laughs> 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 me too, by the way, me too. But um, so I figured I'm going to just pull out a few little nuggets out of this book over the next couple of weeks because it's so it made such an imprint on my life. That um, So the first chapter, Ben, says if you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive, right? If you want to gather honey, don't mm. be, kick over the beehive. So I'm going, to, I'm going to read some quotes. Criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. 
i.e. when we have criticism about Fremantle, yeah. right? <laughs> just, just throwing yeah, that good, out. Good point. Uh, oh, encouragement. Instead, be encouragement. Here's, here's the advice for you. Yeah. Instead of in condemning people, try to understand them. Understand mm. that I made a decision back in 95 to follow a team that <laughs> hasn't. Um, let, so it goes, instead of condemning people, try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism. And mm. it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. Ben, written back in 1937, just as relevant then as it is today. Totally. And I figured... If you go through this chapter, Ben, it was talking about how people on death row who have done the most heinous crimes, when you talk to them, they actually don't think that they've done anything wrong and they don't self-criticise, they actually justify. So even people at the pinnacle and peak of doing bad things to society, if they don't criticise themselves, clearly the technique doesn't work. So Correct. it's really about understanding. Now, if you remember Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Ben, what is one yep. of those? Seek first to understand, then be understood. Yes. In the same vein, I wonder if Stephen Covey had read, read this book, Ben, but back in 1937, How to Win Friends and Influence People. If you want to gather honey, Ben, don't kick over the beehive. Oh, Bryce, it was worth it. The build-up was good, and I think you executed. So there you go. <laughs> you don't give out compliments very often, so I'll bank that one. Thank you very much. Hey, um, I'm super excited to pivot, Ben, to today's um, guest. I'm super excited to chat with Nancy. Yeah? We'll give the intro shortly. But, um, Ben, before we do. Before we do, Bryce, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today. So, obviously, through COVID, we are online here. But we are in North Melbourne, which is part of Melbourne, which is part of the people of the Kulin Nation. And we would like to pay our respects to the elders past and present. Um, and you'll understand why in terms of our very special guest today. Very well said, Ben. So let's do that straight away. Let's cut to our very special guest, our interview with Nancia Guevara. All right, Ben, we've got a very special guest today. We've got an interview with Nancia Guevara. Uh, Nancia is uh, Mugaram, which is from Murray Island, uh, Woodathi and Bundaljari woman from Queensland. Uh, she's an experienced Indigenous affairs professional in media, including journalism, marketing, and has 20 plus years experience in communications, including media production, TV, band, radio, vodcast, podcast, digital marketing, and runs her own business, Amnuris. She's a homeowner and investor who believes in encouraging more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people into home ownership and thinks that would be a really good thing. First of all, welcome to the Property Couch, Nancy. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure. Hey, um, uh, I'm excited about today because you reached out to me um, via email and uh, w and since then when you and I have had a good conversation, but uh, you said to me you'd really like you'd really like us to interview an Aboriginal person um, as I think finance really is in our focus. And so as that is a prompt, I jumped on the phone and started chatting with you and you were saying, well, I think I could introduce you to this person and I could introduce you to this person over here and what about this person? But as I started having that conversation with you and learning more about your backstory and what you would like to see happen, I'm, I sort of thought, you know what, Nancy, I think, I think we should be chatting to you. <laughs> um, so so that's, that's, um, that's, that's really the backstory of how today came about. I'm really excited to learn more about uh, Indigenous culture and, and how that relates to finance and, and perhaps property investing. But what, what prompted you to reach out to me, Nancy? Well, um... We've been talking a lot, I suppose, in the cultural landscape across Australia about Indigenous inclusion, I think. Um, that's been a big topic. And I've always, I think, it's, I think it starts from a personal point of view, to be honest. For some reason, I was really, as a child when I was growing up, actually, I moved around a lot in housing. It seemed to be um, some, a part of my lifestyle, I suppose. And, and I, I really... I think I coveted uh, the need for uh, stability. Um, for example, I went to seven schools in seven years um, when I was a child in primary school. And so I suppose that uh, I really, really um, wanted that, that family stability. And, and that's why I've, I think I've always had a passion for property and that's kind of driven me through what I've done. Um, and I always had a goal um, to have my own house um, and uh, by the time I was 30, 
Um, my grandparents actually from the Torres Strait, they actually set up an Aboriginal housing cooperative in the regional town that we lived in in Queensland in Gladstone. And um, I used to see what they were doing in terms of housing Aboriginal people who needed housing. Um, and I actually worked at um, a, a bank in Queensland, one of my first temporary jobs when I was, before I went to uni, um, just in the holidays. I worked in the home loan centre. I actually transferred the data from manual um, into the computer when they went sort of digital. So I saw all this, all this home loan data and I, and I thought, well, you know, maybe my mum and dad could do that. And I actually initiated my first, my parents' home purchase, their first one. And um, I actually filled the application out for them. And I was in Brisbane at the time. I took it back to Glass and I said, here, sign there, now go and find a house. <laughs> I was about, <laughs> I think I was about nine, uh, I would have been 21 at the time. Um, so that's the extent to which I think I've I've always wanted to have that stability. And I think that as Indigenous people, maybe, you know, we know that for most Australians, I think that um, having a home is the foundation for everything in your life, isn't it? It's, you know, it's where you find security. It's where you find stability for children to go to school. It's where you base your employment from. Um, it's also something that's in, intergenerational, right, uh, that you pass that wealth on to your children and your children's children. And, and um, you know, as Indigenous people, we I don't know if most Australians know this, but we haven't actually been able to own, own homes like others. And that's part of that exclusion, I think, that I'm trying to encourage now because we've got a lot of catching up to do, right? So until, you know, there's... The, the dates might differ, but until for many Indigenous people, they weren't allowed to own, they were literally not allowed to own a home until after 1967, particularly if you were under the control of the, the mission system or the governments. And so, you know, that isn't very long for us to be able to get into it, which is why we're lagging behind most Australians in terms of home own ownership rates. And um, I don't know, for me, you know, the, I like to refer to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yeah, Mm -hmm. One of them is it, it's food, shelter and water, right? Shelter is a key thing for all of us. And I think that it, we know that too when people own their own homes, they, it, it gives them a lot of personal well-being and health. Mm -hmm. People who own homes also um, have higher levels of education. There's a whole bunch of other um, outcomes that are correlated when someone owns a home. So mm -hmm. we know that Indigenous people in Australia have you know, uh, fairly low socioeconomic statuses across the board in lots of indicators, which is why we have the Closing the Gap, you know, program from the government to try and to, to, to get parity on those indicators. Um, and so, so I think that's kind of the basis for my, it's definitely the basis for why I feel that more people, uh, more of our people who are able to get into home ownership, freehold title that is, there's a difference between community um, lands in, in the country where people, you know, aren't able to, but they've already got, you know, their own lands and they're living on those. I'm talking about people who are mostly, I suppose, urban or regional based and who have viable employment, of course, so they can be able to, to get um, into their own homes. Fantastic. Now, you talked about there, Nancy, around um, what money uh, you know, money is sort of a foreign thing for Aboriginal people, right, in terms of, um, you know, you did mention it before, when you live in community-type arrangements and, and tribal-type arrangements back in, you know, for, for the thousands of years, money, you, you're in a share economy, right? You're in a share community-type thing. So can you just take us into that mindset in, in terms of how people have, have now over the, you know, just literally the last you know five or six decades have had to potentially change that mindset to start thinking about money in a different way than the communal uh, approach that aboriginals have in the past yeah um so aboriginal and torres strait islander people um i think we don't think about well look i'm speaking on my own behalf and i shouldn't talk on behalf of everybody that's for sure um but i think that from my experience the way that we think about money and wealth generation is different to most other Australians. Um, and it comes from the way we used to live, you know. And when you think about the ways that we used to live for, you know, we're the old world's oldest living culture mm. here in Australia. Um, we've been here since, you know, 60,000 plus years. And so we've lived a very different life and that's been a, mostly, you know, something that's based on the community. And so the way that I think about wealth is about in our family system, is about abundance 
So prior to, you know, 1788 or 1770, we would we lived a life that was full of abundance. Um, we had everything we needed. We had, a, if you like, a common wealth. We had, you know, we, we ate well, we had really good health. We, you know, we had um, a very complex kinship and family system um, that everybody had a role in. And so when you think about that into the way that we live now, if you transfer that into the way that we live now, it's been, um, uh, you know, it's been disrupted. Um, but many of us still have those, I think, that they are um, inherited, I suppose, um, ideas about, about looking after each other and sharing and living in a very communal way. And that's certainly my family's experience in that we, you know, when we come together, it's about um, looking after each other and even with the children and, and pretty much all aspects of our lives. Um, and so there's a lot of um, different Indigenous peoples around the world who have been talking about what they're calling decolonizing the concept of wealth for us. And how, what does that look like to us? And, and that is making sure that um, it's a holistic approach to it. And that holistic approach includes your well-being, your mental health, your physical health, you know, your financial health, and that of the people around you. Um, I'm sure many other cultural groups do the same. So we're not unique in that way. But, um, you know, that's something that needs to be considered, I think, when it comes to how we approach um, home ownership, because maybe it's, it's not necessarily for everybody either, but for those that it, it's possible, that's who I suppose I'd, you know, I think could be more inclusive in terms of the financial systems in Australia. Mm. Nancy, just on that point then, that's obviously the global view um, mm -hmm. of the First Nations people. What about your particular household um, that you were growing up in? How was money um, a part of that story for you and your family? Well, my family, we had we had a wonderful I had a wonderful childhood full of people, <laughs> extended families. And um, um before Bryce mentioned that I'm a, a Muggerum, a Woodathi, and a Bindaljuru woman. Um and they're from the regions of sort of Sherberg's Townsville, the Torres Strait and Cape York. And I often joke that, you know, I'm I'm actually, that makes me pretty much related to every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island person in, in Queensland. Um, <laughs> and it's not far off the mark, and it's kind of true, um, because there's not many clans, really, when you think about it you know, from the past. But a lot of those family groups and that extended family groups, they were always around us. We were in our community. There was always big family gatherings at our house. My father was a fisherman. My grandfather was a pearl diver, and my father would go out and catch turtle, and we'd share it with everyone or a dugong, and then we'd have these big gatherings. And um, with that, we would, um, yeah, everything would be shared, all the food, because you can't eat one yourself. It's fresh, and, you know, you, traditionally you would never store that sort of stuff. So we we did the same um, and continued to do that um, where, when we're in the same town, which is usually around Christmas and all the big occasions that we get back together again. Um, for example, I'm having a family gathering, um, a family reunion, which I've, COVID has put back, unfortunately. Um, you know, we were expecting between 400 and 500 people at that family reunion. Mm, wow. wow. That's mm. awesome. Yeah. That, that's big. Hey, you, you mentioned before, Nancy, uh, that um, you helped your parents first purchase a house um, when you were 19. You had a goal to purchase yours by 30 you self-declared that you missed it by five you got it by 35 but um can you um can you help us understand a little bit more about because i'm i'm from perth uh, i'm i'm middle australia um i did go to school my first primary school um i went with aboriginal kids um but but beyond that i haven't really had too much exposure to aboriginal culture so you talked about the uh the exclusion in 1967 so for for people where that is news to them, can you help us understand a little bit more about um, the lead up to that and what the change was like within your community when you could do that? And clearly you helped your parents um, get their first purchase. So what was what was it like around then? What, what was it like for your parents to consider buying their first house? Because um, you've covered so much and I think there's a, there's a bit that we can dive into. Oh, in the, when you mean the lead up, do you mean up to 67? Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. Or, or All right. So... So after, at 67, that was, as my, my, most people might know that, that was the 67 referendum that allowed Indigenous people 
that or well, many Indigenous people count as being made citizens of Australia. And, and that was the acknowledgement that there was um, going to be a turning point for better freedom, I suppose would be a good word. Um, it all relates to the constitution and now and how we were excluded. And you might yeah, have heard- you were ostracized, right? And this was yep. a, a turning point about um, integrating you into um, the, the the you know whether we call it the new Australia or whatever the politically correct terminology is. Yep. You you were going to get the same rights um, as as every other citizen, and you have the, the same opportunities potentially as every other citizen, which should have come you know, hundreds of years earlier, but it obviously didn't come. And so that was a, a critical turning point, wasn't it? It was a really critical turning point. And, um, for example, I was born in February 67, and it happened in May 67. So technically when I was born, many Indigenous people, um, you might have heard them say that they were governed under the Flora and Fauna Acts of their relevant states. That's not the case across the country. It all differs because, you know, uh, every state differs in terms of the way they treated people, but on, on a broad sense, um, yeah. And it, it actually, what it actually did was it, it counted uh, the referendum counted us as Australian citizens for, for the purposes of distributing income to the states. And there was, and the other one was that it also, um, the other point of this referendum was that it, uh, so that was in terms of the, the census. Um, yeah, I've forgotten the other thing that um, it enabled. Yeah, you got access. It wasn't the vote. The vote came a little bit earlier, didn't it? Just Oh, that's right. The vo- a lot of people think it's the time when we received the vote as well, but yeah. that actually differed between the states as well. Uh, so the key thing is that we consider it to be the point at which we were included as Australian citizens and to be able to get all access to all of the things that other Australians had and and were not subject to the chief protectors that they often had in the different states that were in Queensland on the various missions. So, you know, it's not that long ago that we've we've wanted this change. Um, So in the lead up to that, you know, things happened in terms of Bryce's question, like, you know, some of us went, some of our men went to war and unlike other Australians, they weren't given land grants, those sorts of things, or they weren't given the same amount of pensions. Um, So there's a whole bunch of things that, you know, were disadvantaged um, as an Indigenous people that, you know, could be, um, we look forward to, you know, addressing now. And we're still addressing a lot of those things in terms of um, the way that I suppose our institutions and government agencies deal with Indigenous peoples. You you have aspiration to not only home ownership at the age of 30 and you got to 35, but you've also been uh, an aspiring property investor, having transacted on a number of property investments. Can you tell us a little bit about um, who who was actually uh, who who was actually paving the path before you, or were you pioneering that? Um, who were you using as uh, a mentor for for those um, progressions that you were making, and, and what's your view on? On property investing today, right? Um, I um, I had a few examples. I actually, when I was at university, I was my I was the first person in my family to go to university at the University of Queensland. And um, but while I was there, I had a part time job to to you know earn some money. And I happened to pick up a job at L J Hooker to Wall, which is a really big real estate agency. Mm. And um, I worked there for six years. I loved it. The characters that I met in that that agency and that sector, I just, I just was my, there was, you know, I sort of liked them. They were sort of my, my clan um, when I was in Brisbane because my family were up the coast. Um, So I saw a lot of people buying houses and I thought, oh, well, if I'm going to, and I, and, and I know that a lot of the time I wasn't necessarily managing my money well. While I was at uni, it was fine because I had a lot of work to do and I actually saved money. But um, when I got out of uni and I started working and, you know, going out and all that sort of getting more income, I always had a budget, but I didn't necessarily save in that budget. So, But I did know for sure that I wanted to to get into my own property. I didn't quite make it uh, until I met a boy. And um, we, well, actually, I did save enough money before I'd met him for my own deposit on a house. And by this time, I was living in Sydney. Uh, it wasn't a house, actually. It was just a, you know, an apartment in the inner west around Dulwich Hill where I was living. And I was looking for one to buy until, until I met him. And then um, I sort of put that on ice because things were going really well. 
and it was just getting really late as far as I was concerned. And one of the things that I realised was I didn't have a lot of knowledge about it. And you asked me about my mentors. Um, I didn't really have them. A particular mentor, I suppose, because nobody in the family owned houses. I think one of my aunts did actually. Um, she'd been a government employee. But um, what I did was I just devoured everything that I could possibly find about it. I thought, if I'm going to do well in this, and if I consider myself to be someone who's who's got the smarts to succeed in life, and I've succeeded in other areas, and I thought, well, then why am I not doing very well with my finances? And so, what by focusing on it and by giving it the time and the attention and making space in my life for it, I, you know, I got to save that deposit and I learned a lot. And then one of the things that I also learned was that when you're buying property, you should build a team, right? So, you know, you find, you know, you know your legal team, you find your, your mentor team, you find your mortgage broker, you find, you know, maybe a loan structure, a loan strategist as well. So, that's what I did. Um, but I suppose I did that a little bit later when with the the boy that I met, I bought a property in 2005 that was in Clovelly. Because I'm a Torres Strait Islander and we like to live by, the, I find myself living on peninsulas and near the water all the time because I, I, I just find that that's what I need. Um, so I think that fared me well too, to be honest, yes. <laughs> Clovelly. Mm. And then we decided we needed a sea change. We went down to Austinmere. And we bought a house there um, and we renovated. And what we've done both times was we renovated both. And so we, you know, added value to those and enabled us to buy the next big thing um, in Austin. And we had a baby and um, unfortunately that relationship sort of ended. And then, but because of that, and we had property, I was on my own with my with my child and with my daughter. And, um, and I decided then that I needed one for us as well because, that's always what, I, what I'd always wanted. And so we had, and I had, because of the proceeds of the previous sale, went and bought another one in Greenwich, which is by the water again, on the North Shore of um, Sydney. Mm. Um, yeah. And then following that, I knew that that was in um, Greenwich, I bought in 2012, which was really lucky because I seemed to be quite lucky. I mean, in the first two properties, we were riding a wave, you know, property was was really increasing in value really fast. And if if you weren't in there, you know, we were lucky, I think, in some ways, because if you didn't get in, it was really difficult to get in after that. And so I was lucky to have gotten in. And in some ways, you know, being with my partner helped that in the, in the initial beginnings. Um, but after buying the property in Greenwich, I realised that, you know, it had capitalised heaps, it, like the, the growth in it was phenomenal, by 60% plus. Mm. And, and so I thought, oh, you know, being someone who was not from, um, you know, the sort of family wealth or any other kind of wealth, I thought, I'm going to capitalise on this. So I took it and then I reinvested in um, and would move, my daughter moved into um, a different school in this in the city. So we bought, I went and bought a, a small property in Balmain. And what, what I've done in both instances was I'd seen real estate grow so much. I, I knew that it was important to get in and not to have the full 20% deposit. So both times, and it was from a lot of the work and the reading that I've done with um, hanging out in forums, property forums with other investors, that I, I bought in with 5% both times, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it really did fare me well because I put the rest of the money on the offset, just like you say, and it was really, really good advice because I always, if anything, you know, I had a buffer in case anything went wrong and I was lucky, nothing did, did go wrong and I've still got that, um, property in Balmain today, which has, has done really well as well. <laughs> no um, doubt. Nancy, I want to just go back to, um, you know, the challenge of not having any mentors or people in your in your mob to talk to around money and money management, um, you know, no leadership there. You did mention that you you hit the books and you you did learn. What were some of the, um, the, the, the learnings or teachings that you had that 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 you know boded well for you around capturing savings. So, wh what were some of the tricks or or things that you implemented in your money management that was a, that allowed you to to get your deposit? Now we know we all know that spend more than you you know uh, sorry spend less than you earn is the classic. But mm -hmm. was there any little way in which you organised your money into jars or into into categories or anything like that in in that time? Look, um, I am. Um... No, I I have to admit, you know, I, I still feel like I'm a person who's teetering on the edge of, you know, going shopping. Um, 
<laughs> she's an Aboriginal writer by the name of Anita Heiss, and she she um she said she she jokes in one of her books that you know it's Westfield dreaming. Um, <laughs> but I um no, I I I need I need to have constraints around me and processes. And for me, property was also about saving. Mm. Um, for saving vehicle. Yeah. It is, it's for saving, and it's useful, you know, it's really necessary. So that's why I did it. Um, because I knew that if I didn't do it, I would fritter it away just well, because of history. So what I did do this when I to get a deposit, I worked hard. I worked really hard at times and I had, you know, as many jobs as I could have. I, I worked in full-time jobs and I did consultancies on the side. And that's how I got to the point. And um, you know, a few other bonuses, like one of the things I never used to do was take um um uh, holidays when I was working often so and if I did take holidays I'd work again and that's how I um, was able to get deposits together and you know with, when my partner came along that made it um, able for us to buy something mm. um, bigger but mm. you did it you did it an incredibly important thing Nancy whether you mm. consciously or subconsciously knew what you were doing and, and I want to talk to that that was um, in a separation that, that when that relationship broke down and you got the proceeds of that relationship, you put it into property. Um, there are too many people um, in this country who uh, potentially get a, a windfall um, and don't know what to do with it now, and they go and rent, and then all of a sudden they get into a cycle of renting. And and and, and by, by making that critical decision that you made in terms of uh, making sure that you had a home ownership um, for you and your daughter, um, was was absolutely fundamental because, as you said, uh, you got that appreciation of that value and that has allowed you to continue to keep building your wealth out. So I think that's a, a really important message, not only to the Indigenous people and First Nations, but it's, it's also a critically important thing to all of our listeners um, because we do know through this COVID-19 period that um, separations and, and that are on the increase um, and so getting the right advice, um, if you're going through difficult times around what you do with that money after you are um, financially separated um, is really important. Yeah. I think the other thing that I, I had recognised from some of the research that I did, I re realised that I think what makes a good purchase, so I don't necessarily think there was an accident that I've done well, um, I picked really good areas. Yeah, you did. Um, you know, yeah. location, location, location. I think I recognise that. Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Working at LJ Hooker. You know, that that's a kind of a higher end sort of suburb in Queensland around St Lucia. And, you know, Clovelly, Austin Mare, Greenwich and Balmain. They're, they're all mm. amazing suburbs and desirable suburbs to live in, is, to use your terms. And one of the other things that I learned um, is that um, you make your money when you buy. You don't make your money, yeah? You make your money when you buy. And so I often bought under market value. I bought under market value. And I recognised they were under market value, um, particularly the Greenwich property and even the Belmain one, which I still have. And um, and then you always have to think about, and I think I've heard you say this too, if you or others, real estate advisors, that you have to have a strategy for exiting. Yes. And, you know, in a, in a downturn like COVID, where um, you know real estate is 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 potentially you know losing value, um, those properties that are more desirable are going to be easier to to let go of if you if you need to. So I was always really conscious of that because you know it can be quite scary for uh, I think you know some of my siblings that you know the thought of having mortgages with six figures or seven figures that's just un, un, unfathomable. You know, and it is quite scary, but I, I also like to think of debt as good because lots of people don't think of debt as good. So there's good debt and bad debt, as I say. For me, it's a positive and not not a negative to to have this as, as long as you've got the means to to pay the loans and that. But that also means that, you know, finding your, and I knew that, you know, I've been in the same sector of work for a long time um, and it's very secure for me because of my level of ex depth of experience in that as well. Yeah. Yeah, Nancy, the extension of um, 
of you know you make your money when you buy for us is around the flight to quality and actually buying the right assets because if you buy make the right decision at the beginning because sometimes in some of those areas even if you're talking about Balmain um, it's very difficult to get you, you, you clearly did by your anecdote but it's it's very difficult to get under market value when you've got two or more people interested in a property um, mm. typically it's a, a competitive scenario and that's what makes them so good as an investment right but we, we say that you make your money when you buy, given the fact that you made the right decision. Because you, mm. you, you can't undo a poor decision 10 years later, given that um, the fact that the types of properties that you were chasing had, you know, universal appeal, but even for your own personal needs culturally, that you need to be near the water and all those sorts of things, which I think is good. And I think it's worth saying that um, you're making reference to us. You know, I haven't I haven't disclosed it, but you, you are a, a property couch listener, which we, which we appreciate that you're doing. And obviously that's part of... Um, yeah, just one of the tools that you're using to to build up your knowledge. You mentioned you've got siblings, um, so I'm 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 interested to know, did they follow a similar path of of property ownership as you? And if they did, um, you're shaking your head, so no. And and so what what would be some of the because you talked about the fact you you didn't have mentors, but clearly you would be a mentor in your community and for a lot of people who are who are aspiring to do what you've done because you pioneered. You know, you were doing stuff that didn't have a pathway. Uh, set before you and and so this there's a lot of wisdom that in in your own story so um ha- have they asked you for advice have they asked you for guidance or is it something that's too difficult to to broach yeah they have quite a few friends have you know they've sort of seen what i've done and and they're kind of wondering because i'm working alongside others who, who and um who may not have their own property particularly in sydney right but um you know being in a relationship to help that for me but um being someone who's done that. And I found it really scary too, to be honest, when I did it, but I sort of sort of felt the fear and did it anyhow. Um, yeah. Nice. And, um, yeah, so I've had a few friends ask me for advice and, you know, how do you how did you get there? How did you do this? And, you know, for me, the, the, I always thought you had to have 20% deposit, but you don't, mm. you know, you really don't. And um, I feel as though that's sort of not widely known if you can. And I also felt that, you know, it's better to get in at a higher interest rate with that smaller deposit because when I was looking to buy, the the prices were going up so fast, you couldn't save the Mm. the extra that was going up by. So it was more important to get in than to, and to to be a part of that rise than to to, to sit on the sidelines and keep trying to save to keep up with the increase because you couldn't have done it. But in regional areas where lots of Indigenous people live, um, oh, actually, to be honest, the, the, the highest density of Indigenous people live in cities, and particularly in Western Sydney. That is the highest density of Indigenous people in the nation. Um, mm. We think that it's perhaps in, in the Northern Territory, but it's actually really small numbers in absolute terms compared to the density of people in Western Sydney. Um, and Lots of other Aboriginal peoples live in regional areas from the towns where those original missions used to be, right? So in those areas where mobs live, and my family are primarily in Cairns and, and, and up in the far north of Queensland from Gladstone and Brisbane upwards, um, those areas are cheaper to buy than to rent. And, you know, one of my, in my brother, whilst my siblings haven't gotten their own purchases, their children have. Great. Yeah. And I'd like to think that that, is because of Annie Nancy, you know, has in some way inspired them to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. That's terrific. Well, I mean, if someone else is listening to this, not not only Indigenous people, uh, well, probably specifically Indigenous people, but what 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 is the first step for someone who's inspired by your story, seeing that your path has been multiple property ownership, and clearly it's done it's done well for you? What? How do they start the conversation? How do they um, potentially break some? some conditioning around um, stepping forward? Because you talked about the exclusion up until 1967 has now created a legacy down the track that the, that, that Indigenous Australians are are behind the eight ball. How, how do they catch up and how do they, right. how do they get, get a bit more parity? Well, um, the statistics, I had to look this up before um, coming on, 66% of most Australians are, are in home ownership. Home ownership rates for Indigenous people are 38%. In regional areas, it's even less. It's 18% for Indigenous people, and these are government statistics um, done by Deloitte Access Economics, um, and compared to 57% in regional areas. So whilst the, you know the, it wasn't as common as other Australians to buy homes, there are other Aboriginal people who are in home ownership, obviously, because in that period, and I think I've been the the spearhead of the generations that's had all of the opportunities, right? 
I went to high school, ended high school, I went to university, I came out, I got a good job, you know, I worked in government for quite a long time and now I've got my own business. Um, so there's that number of Indigenous people coming through universities and their children are and going into professional careers. In the past, apparently, they used to go into government the most. Now they're going into the private sector. So with that, um, a lot more people that have home ownership. So I think that most, given our communities are fairly connected, I would suggest that you find someone who has done it and ask them for guidance. Find someone who you trust, ask them to, you know, be your advisor or, or put your point in the right direction or be your mentor. But that's not to say that you should sort of listen to everything because about it, for people who aren't experts, I think, what you should then do is build your team. And I and I've certainly done that because some of my family, I'm sure, think I'm mad for having a mortgage. And you know, if you get hit up, hit up for money, you sort of they sort of say, "Can I borrow something from you?" And I go say, "Well, you know, I'm you know negative this in <laughs> in terms of my wealth, in terms of you know the the mortgages that I carry." I would is say there, that, that that's all getting expertise around you. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you there. But is is there a, is there a tall poppy um, version if you're doing well? And you uh, perceive to be very well off. Is that is that embraced um, within the indigenous culture? Well, look, I think like um, you know, most, um, the mainstream culture. You know, it's not really something that's talked about. Mm -hmm. yet, is it? And I think that that's part of the problem is that we don't openly have around the dinner table conversations of, about. Well, I don't. Not in my family, anyhow. And um, you know, if you don't share that information. I suppose then um, it's um... and I, and I think that happens in all societies and all cultures, mm -hmm. right? Where um, mm -hmm. if a if a culture has um, a, a, a community social culture of sharing and so forth, that type of success and 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 spoils can sometimes be frowned upon, right? Um, uh, and as opposed to um, households or cultures or or exposures that you've had around people who have high aspiration and like what you said before Nancy you've worked hard you've worked extra jobs you've done whatever you've do, you've done to get yourself uh, you and your daughter into a financial position um, that is uh, that is comfortable and hopefully will be more than comfortable for you and and that, that that's a you know that comes down to obviously some of the fears we have about fear, fear of failure but there are a lot of people that also have fear of success um, where, you know, they don't know how to cope with it and, you know, taking themselves outside of that com comfort zone yeah. is also is also a real challenge. Now, it's, I want to, you go. Oh, look, I just wanted to point out that, you know, given on that generation that's had all the opportunities, I feel as though we haven't had that history of intergenerational wealth building and handing on. So I often like to think that, you know, I'm hearing, you know, if I were to lose my job, or if the property market were to fall over, then, you know, all of that could be brought down very fast, yeah, mm -hmm. um, with the loss of a job or, or a steady income. So I feel, you know, that I'm. that's why I'm, I'm quite vigilant, I suppose, is the, the right word about how I do that and not taking too many risks in that. Yeah, um, but, you, but you're also, you've organised your money in a sense that provides you with that buffer, that, mm -hmm. that, that financial stretch uh, for for you know th those emergencies and you've done that through using offset and you know giving yourself that buffer and and I think that's that's really important. The other thing that um, you know that we want to also get out to uh, the indigenous community and people listening out there is around what the banks can actually do um, for our indigenous and first nation people. Do you want to share a little bit about you know some of the uh, some of the ways in which the the banks can look after? our uh, Indigenous people? Look, uh, yeah, yes, certainly, um, you know, the the big full banks have a range of products that they now recognise and they sign up to reconciliation action plans and, and they have a range of products that they that are focused at bringing in, um, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. I saw one just recently come in my email box from Westpac for, you know, financial literacy courses and there's a, there is a big awareness of that. So I think that, you know, if you want to look for it, then that, advice is out there um, and there's a lot of free advice too you know I went on to forums online and I listened to the property couch you know from the beginning and there used to be you know a channel on 
sky that you could get some, you know, Margaret Lomas was on as well. Um, so yeah, there's loads of stuff out there if you want if you want to look for it. And but I think that the other thing to recognise is that there's still a challenge there for those institutions to be able to think about how to bring in people with who who don't meet the sort of the normal criteria. Or there's you know there's the big full banks and they're probably you know they're fairly traditional, but there's a whole bunch of other financial products there at the moment that are, you know online. Mm. Um, this is the new kind of banking way really and I'm looking forward to seeing what sort of innovation that they might have and bring for people who are not just Indigenous but for other people who who want to to get into home ownership and um, sort of don't know where to start I suppose. I think the other thing to point out about that is that if you do get people who are in perhaps social housing into their own home ownership mm -hmm frees up that social housing for other people to come through. So there's lots of, you know, it's not just for the benefit of Indigenous people's kind of abundance, I'd like to say, um, that we have homes and that we have, you know, abundant lives, but for the whole of the community that would work for everybody because that generates, you know, well-being for the whole of the Australian economy if we bring up everybody with us, yeah? A fantastic message. So, Nancy, you, uh, throughout that journey, did um, ha when when you approached uh, the finance, did you did you go straight to a bank, or were you dealing with a mortgage broker? Um, I did in the first two purchases, um, and that was just because I, you know, I hadn't learned a lot. Um, I think, and I went to the ME Bank first, and then the second time, I think I went to. Um, we went to ANZ, which was my, yeah. Um, but after that, I, I, you know, that's probably when it was sort of accelerated after we, we separated. And then I, and I think, you know, I went to a broker after that from all of the advice that I've received. And I honestly would recommend that because they help you to negotiate something that you, you're not familiar with and to be able to push those um, hopefully approvals through. Uh, through the banks and, and it takes the stress off you of not knowing what they're doing because they have a lot of inside insight into what those banks um, processes are and they have relationships with those banks and so I'd really not highly recommend going through a broker. Mm. Yeah that's a good tip so so clearly uh, one of the things that was exciting for me to talk to you about was clearly for me to better understand um, some of the cultural challenges and opportunities that exist for for Indigenous people. I was Super keen after we chatted to find out more about you and your backstory and your journey through property, which has been which has been amazing, right? So and so I got I got a couple of questions for you. One one is what's the what's the what's the end game for you? What what's the what's the pinnacle at the end, at the top of the mountain that you're striving for? And two, are there any questions that that I haven't asked or Ben hasn't asked that you think is really really relevant that that will will help with your mission? Um, to really help the financial literacy of Indigenous uh, Australians so that they can get into home ownership and, and then, you know, fulfil all their financial ambitions as well? Uh, so the key goal for me is was always to take my finances out of my life as a stressor mm -hmm. uh, because there's significant other pressures that you face in this life and that was one of them for me um, and also to see myself into retirement well. And independent, really, um, you know, with, without having to you know, rely perhaps on the pension. That's one of my goals. Um, and that's all the goal has ever been, really, to be able to, to get there and to be comfortable and have a, you know, a contented retirement, hopefully, um, which I, hopefully I'm on track to do. Yeah, so that, that's the key thing for me. Um, in terms of anything that we have approached, um, well, I, you know, I think it does start with you. I think you need to have or have the dream to, to do that. Um, it's, you know, I don't think it's something you can approach, you know, in a half-hearted way. Certainly I sort of really took it on with gusto and I think that if you if that's what you want, then you need to have that personal drive to get there um, and, and then to find, like I said before, the right people um, to help you get there. I don't think it's for everyone either. I'm not trying to say that, you know, everybody or needs to be in their own home ownership, if it, you know, if because many Indigenous people have their own country. I certainly have too um, from my my peoples. But if it's in, if you're in a position to do that and if it 
you know, will save that stress and we know that we have lots of stresses on us, particularly as Indigenous people, then it's, you know, for me, it was something that really helped to alleviate that stress and to know that, you know, in my my older years, I'm going to be okay, yeah? yeah. Which is terrific. Mm. And, and that sort of leads into my final question, Nancy, which was around what would you tell your 21-year-old self um, again in terms of what you've learnt um, in your ears and the wisdom that you've built up? Um, uh, <laughs> um, um, do you know what? I, look, I, t I totally believe in fate and, and, you know, that I that the pathway that I've had is the pathway that was meant for me. I think that that seems to have happened all along the way in my life that I've, you know, you know it's, whether it's luck or, or the you know, it's just fate for me. Um, but if I if I would go back and tell myself something, then I suppose I might say something like, get a move on. Start <laughs> you know. um, yeah, get a move on and start sooner. And I would tell other people that too, actually, which is why I'm really pleased that, you know, some of my nieces and nephews are, are in home of their own ownership. Because if I had started a lot earlier, then I think I could have relaxed a lot sooner as well. So Beautiful. <laughs> taking the foot. The just do it message. Get yeah. on with it. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Hey Nancy, I'm really excited that you uh, accepted my invitation to come on and uh, and chat to us. I, you know, I think that uh, that Ben said it very well. Then where you've got a lot of wisdom to share, you've got a lot of leadership um, uh, for for all Australians, but also for for people within your own culture. And um, I'm excited that uh, that that. That you 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 have a retirement that looks comfortable for you. It's uh, free of the money stressor. I think that's amazing. And um, uh, you know, Ben and I, you know, thank you for for coming on to the couch and um, and and sharing your message with our community. Thanks, Ben and Bryce, for having me on, and and um, Ivis as well. Um, and it's really customary for us to acknowledge that you know our past um, here in Australia and I'd just like to acknowledge that where I am now I'm sitting on the land of the the Ghana people of, of South Australia. Thank you Nancy. Well, can you can you help us better understand what 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 does that actually mean for the culture when when you acknowledge um, acknowledge make the acknowledgement that you did um, what what is the flow and all the all the benefit you know the benefactor of that? Well I think that um, for lots of Indigenous people, it's about um, acknowledgement, mm -hmm. recognition and respect. And if you don't know, you know, what has happened in the land before you, because I, I truly believe in that, that, you know, you dig through the layers and that, you know, if you go back as far as possible, then you know that that's where my ancestors have walked for years. I love the stories. You know, when you think about Sydney, in fact, you know, Oxford Street, George Street in Sydney, um, King Street in Newtown and Enmore Road, they are known Aboriginal pathways. So you're literally walking on the tracks of our ancestors here in Australia. And I think that it's something to be aware of. It's something that's unique for Australia and for Australia to the rest of the world to have the world's oldest living culture here. So it's about beginning, I think, to get that understanding of, you know, what has happened here in the past um, because it certainly wasn't taught to us in school and lots of people right. are tell me that now and it's just the beginning of a thread so if you know it's the Ghana people then you can find begin to find out more about the Ghana people and who's around and surviving today and many of us who are here today come from really strong people and that's why we're still here today well it's fantastic maybe you can uh, maybe you can help Ben and I contribute and mentor us because we'd certainly like to uh, to play our part in that um, at uh, you know as part of this episode so maybe maybe you can help us with that but again yeah. it's been a real it's been a real privilege um, to have you come on to the property couch and um and anyone who opens up and shares their own stories and tells anecdotes of how it was for them and their first property and what they paid and what they did um i, I just think is a rare gift because um you know in this country we've talked ben and i've talked about a lot that not a not a lot of people talk about their stuff and so for you being courageous to do that i think is mm -hmm. um is is very very good for our community so thanks again for coming on and um uh, yeah, we we look forward to seeing you remove, continue to remove the the money stress <laughs> out of your life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank Tom. you, Nancy. Yeah. All right, Ben. Um, a very very good episode. I must admit, um, some of that stuff was um was news to me, particularly around the exclusion in 1967. I didn't know that. Um, but I think um I think 
I said it at the beginning, but the idea of Nancy coming on was just something that was really exciting for me because I wanted to better understand some of the challenges that they faced and some of the obstacles that that needs to be overcome, but also just to celebrate a story that Nancy has done a terrific job of of setting herself up for a retirement with using her words mm. that um, not only gives her a, a more comfortable retirement but removes the stresses around money. Yeah, and you know, coming back to the the stats that she was talking about with only thirty eight percent of home ownership, it's not it's not enough. Um, and as she refers to it, her clan, her mob, she wants to see you know her uh, her community um, uh, do better. And she's not so, she's not judgmental on that. She's basically saying if you want to, um, you know, this is a pathway. And I think her message not only to uh, the indigenous community, uh, but also. Um, you know, to to effectively all Australians is um, have the courage um, to give it a go. And when you set your sights on a goal, and even though she set her sights on home ownership by the age of 30, having her own property, um, she still got there. Even though it was a little bit later, the fact that she'd set that goal and, and as she said, she had a deposit, so she could have potentially bought something by herself. So I think that's just a message to everyone because we all know home ownership is hard. Right. We all know that saving for a deposit is the hardest piece of getting um, onto into the market, and I think that's an important message. And I, you know, there are certainly in terms of what we're seeing from government incentives at the moment, more broadly speaking, is going to be part of what I talk about in you know in what's making property news shortly. Very good. So, Nancy, thanks for reaching out to me. I think there's two really cool parts of your story. One, just personal success, and two, on how you can um, better help us understand um, Indigenous culture, Indigenous finances, and what we can do to help um, play our part in improving that. So that was terrific. Hey, uh, my life hack today, Ben, is a call out to all of the food allergy families, Ben. This doesn't mm. apply to you. You, when when we eat, you like to load up on the gluten, whereas I don't. I have a, I have a food allergy, Bryce. It's called tomatoes. Yeah, that's a I preference, don't. not an allergy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say seafood diet or something then. But, um, yeah, seafood, true. need it. Yep. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so it's just a shout out to all my fellow uh, families who deal with food allergies with their children. Um, one of the ways that we deal with that within our family is we, we do date nights with the boys, Ben. So we did one of those last uh, Friday where Andrea busted off with Samuel yep. um, and I busted off with Jack, right? Now, um, it's... <laughs> So it started out that we were going separate. Then Jack's favourite restaurant, which is Cave Pizza, wasn't taking any bookings. So then he wanted to go to where uh, Andrea and Sam were going and Sam knocked it on the head big time. He said, not on your life, buddy. You are on your own. So uh, yeah, se okay. separate story. He wanted, he wanted his community own, right there. <laughs> wanted his own mum's time, which is good. But so what happened is, so Andrea, um, Andrea took Samuel so we could take advantage of gluten-free and dairy-free mm -hmm. And I took Jack. Now, of course, he went down the pizza line, Ben. We got uh, the local restaurant, had some amazing pizzas. But um, the, so so the point of my life hack is for the food allergy families to consider having single dates with um, with the kids so that you can actually uh, obviously acknowledge the food allergy. But the thing is, I, I drew the straw with, the straw with Jack, who doesn't have the same amount of allergy challenges as Sam. Yep. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, Ben, did I, did I pay the price? Because he ordered a, a Nutella pizza. Have you ever had one of them? <laughs> the boys have had one before at home, a self-made one. Oh yeah. my oath, my good! And I had, and part of it was I. Part of my thing was with Jack because we have to say no so often. My my mantra was I'm just going to say yes within yeah. reason to any request. Yeah. Dad, can I have a lemonade? Um, yes. Because <laughs> we normally do juice or water, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had a lemonade, and then he's he's t tucked into the pizza, and then normally when Andrew's there, we order the Hawaiians. And she'll get the the vegan cheese or the goat's cheese or whatever. And I forgot, right? So, and he's looked at me. He's gone, can I have the Hawaiian? I ordered the Hawaiian. And then I forgot to say something about the cheese. So he's looked at me, just wait, not not letting me know you've forgotten to say something about the cheese, just whether or not he'll get away with it. But because it's, because I'm, because when the when the pizza's delivered, I've gone, oh, no, I forgot about the cheese. And he goes, he just looked at me, he goes, I was wondering if you'd remember that. That's the first thing he said. <laughs> And, and then he goes, uh, and then he goes, Dad, um, and we're having the Nutella pizza. And I'm thinking, oh, no, my regime is saying, yes, is really going to stretch me. So I've had to have half this Nutella pizza, Ben. So I don't know if you've ever had one, but it is full on, blew my head off the sugar yeah. off yeah. the charts. But anyway, yeah. I digressed on my story other than to say for those with food allergies, consider having separate dates yeah. with the children so the non-food allergy child can go to town. Yeah. And still serve food allergies. Yes, and, and for those who don't have food allergies, but, you know, to have preferences, yeah. 
aubergine, eggplant that can find another home. There is no place for that that particular vegetable or fruit to find its way into the uh, Kingsley household. Is it a vegetable or a fruit, Ben? It is a vegetable. I don't think it has uh, nuts. Isn't it a fruit? Uh, it's got seeds, seeds, I should say. It's got seeds in it. So I don't even know that. There you oh. go. I just don't like it. Just don't not, like it. We're not going to get you snorting for your <laughs> seeds anytime soon, are we? But um, no, hey, anyway. what's making property news? Oh, a couple of things are making property news for all of our New South Wales listeners, Bryce. There's an announcement this week. More demand stimulus coming in from the New South Wales government as they made changes to their stamp duty regime. So what it'll mean is newly built homes worth up to 800,000. Um, so they've moved the, the uh, cap higher. Um, they'll see uh, uh, translate to a saving of $31,335. So anything mm. up to newly built, no stamp duty, right? Mm. Now, in terms of 1 million, um, so uh, you can see that we've moved and made some changes also in regards to properties um, up to $1 million. So if you're if you've got to say it by way of example, a $900,000 property, um, you'll only be charged $20,168 in stamp duty, which is down from $35,835. Mm. So, and the other one, vacant land values of up to $400,000 will also be exempt from stamp duty, which is mm. a potential saving price of $7,793. So that's good news for all of those people looking to uh, to get a bit of dirt or buy a new property in the New South Wales um, state. So that's the first thing that's making property news, Bryce, um, which is good, also, good. again, For those under the Money Smarts regime, straight into the uh, the offset account, all those savings, Ben, of course. Of course. So I, I really like that story. Obviously, the other two big stories of the week have been around um, rental. Um, r- mm. Rental, uh, you know, sort of values have gone down and... What was interesting in the um, in the June quarter CPI data, the the you know that they had never seen a fall like that before, and it's obviously no. what we've talked about on the back of um, you know li- limited demand, um, landlords um, renegotiating with tenants mm. to give them some type of um, a deferred or reduced rent to help them out a little bit in uh, in this pandemic, um, and obviously you know with a glut of apartments and so forth um, with limited demand. Um, we're starting to see some of those rents fall. So, I don't, you know, again, I don't think this is a longer term position, um, but we did see uh, rents go down and that's also something of interest. Uh, finally, finishing off in terms of looking at the demand side again, Bryce, um, auctions this weekend, just a little read on the auction market for, for this weekend. Um, so we're talking about 611 um, properties scheduled for auction this weekend in Sydney. Now that's up from 500 and 94 from last week. Um, And interestingly enough, it's higher than the 386 for the same time last year. So last year they only did 386, Uh, there's now 611. So this is a good test for that market, right? So um, in terms of from a supply side coming on, obviously Melbourne, it's, it's, you know, there's only 357 scheduled. so yeah, largely that's just to get to get a finite date for people to make the purchases before. well that's right exactly so it's a it's a conditioning thing so we don't really read too much into that but um if we see the auction clearance rate still holding around the sort of 60 to 65 in sydney that sort of means that property prices aren't going down uh, anytime soon they'll sort of be holding steady i think that's important and so my final message on the back of that because i have been talking to a lot of um, first home buyers and people who are looking to get into the market and they've all been sort of saying, you know, I think I'm just going to wait until September and just to see what happens then. Well, we don't, we know that there's no more fiscal cliff. There is going to be some changes. We absolutely know that. But my message to anyone who's thinking of buying later in the year, start your looking now. Mm. Because if everyone's thinking the same thing, that's that pent up demand that we talked about as well. If you find a good opportunity now, um, grab it. Um, and take a long-term view. Uh, but if everyone's sort of saying, look, I'm going to start getting serious about this in, in September and October, the, the reality is, is you're going to be under a fair bit of competition. Um, so, it, you know, you might then go into the sold section on, you know, realestate.com or domain and the portals and go, oh, look at that one that sold, you know, uh, two, two weeks ago, four weeks ago. That would have been perfect for me. And mm. now, I've got, now I've got a heap of people competing with me. So, you know, it's obviously 
um, going to be a consideration. So if you start to look now, um, you can get a sense of the interest and demand, how long properties are staying on the market in the area of interest to you, in your price point of interest, uh, and that's going to, you know, determine um, how quickly you'll take action. So if you have any already started looking now and you're thinking about September, now's the time to uh, to get in there. And I said that a month ago, now is the time to start looking. So it's just a little reminder there, Bros. Yeah, it is a reminder, but uh, very timely because, um, yeah, people people will be kicking themselves if they get amongst all the uh, all the competition and then realise that they could have paid less. Yeah, so well said. Correct. Hey, um, great episode, Ben. I think that we covered a lot of ground today, which is uh, oodles of fun. But, uh, mate, just a reminder before I throw to you that if you've got no plans for tonight, Ben, just make sure you tune in to the ABC. Sure, I'll do that. Melbourne, yeah, all- Melbourne Port Adelaide, wasn't it? Melbourne Port Adelaide. And uh, folks, with fingers crossed, hopefully Fremantle smack Collingwood um, this this weekend because I'm not looking forward to your right of reply next week. So until then, Ben. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you follow the pies. <laughs> no, but only if you act on it. I normally say well said, Ben, but uh, not this week. <laughs> See you, folks. See you later. Hey there folks, Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and are only listened to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the A, B, C, D, and so much more. And you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. And don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.